I'm excited because we're entering into a new uh, four-week sermon series leading up to uh, Christmas. It's a four-part series, rather, that we're calling Freedom in a Manger. And the reason why I'm calling it Freedom in a Manger is because what we're going to do is dig into Scripture, dig into the birth story of Jesus, the Christmas story, and draw from that story certain themes, certain elements. So there's going to be themes of uncertainty, uh, themes of fear, uh, themes of impatience, sin and mistakes and failures, uh, something that you know we know all about, and at the same time, we may actually struggle with, like impatience or uncertainty, we may struggle with or feel like trapped in from time to time. And so as we dig through scripture, what we're going to find is freedom uh, from the bondage of fear, freedom from the bondage of this insecurity, freedom from the bondage of this sin and these mistakes that cause shame in our life, freedom from all this bondage as we focus on the character of Christ uh, and uh, his you know, coming, uh, Christ Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, today, I entitled the sermon, if you can go to the next slide there, I entitled uh, the sermon, You Expect Me to Believe This? Uh, we're going to be looking at a man in the book of Luke chapter 1. His name is Zacchaeus. And let me just pause. And uh, for those of you that may be interested, uh, we've mapped out what our journey is going to look like from now until Easter. And so if you're interested on like what the sermons are going to be like and all that stuff, just read Luke 1 through 9 because that's where we're going to kind of head in the next season. There's going to be different topics, different themes, different sermon series in the midst of it. But we're going to be in this book of Luke for quite a while, up until about Easter. We're going to start in Luke 1, learn from a man named uh, Zechariah. And Zechariah was, uh, he was a man of uncertainty at one moment in his life, and he doubted the promises of God. And what we're going to see uh, in that moment is the reality of that circumstance, and on the flip side, not only the result, but we'll see the freedom that he eventually found, the freedom that you and I can find in the midst of our uncertainty and doubt in the words and in the promises of God. So turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 1. That's where we're going to be. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 5. Now, this is the author, Luke, who is introducing Zechariah as well as his wife, Elizabeth, into the scene. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them, this is important, so uh, mark this down, maybe underline it. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. So they were in good standing with God, observing all the, Lord, all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So a couple things, Zechariah and Elizabeth together, they were a priestly family. They both had this background. Uh, Luke wanted us to make sure that we understood that they are a godly, they're a good godly family. They love the Lord. They were obedient to the Lord. They were surrendered to the Lord. Uh, they were faithful to his law, to his commands, to his decrees. It says in verse 7, though, but they were childless. They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. And so though they were faithful, uh, though they came from this background, though they were obedient to the Lord, this uh, you know, not able to conceive would have been devastating for them. Culturally, people would have, you know, what they saw from kids is the kids were like the Lord's blessing on people. It, it was a way that he blessed his, you know, his faithful people. Uh, it, th this, would have been, uh, this would have been shameful for them because people would have seen and maybe they believed that there was some sort of curse. Like this was a, a means of like divine punishment from the Lord. And so you can imagine them praying and praying and praying for years as a couple, for years, like, when are we going to have our kid? When are we going to be able to conceive? And now all of a sudden, they're just too old. It's physically impossible. You can imagine at this moment, though they're faithful, they've lost all hope. That's the situation. That's kind of 
uh, where Luke has us. Now we turn the page and we're on verse eight and Luke says this, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to do two things, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. Now, uh, you can read right past that, but I think it's important that we pause and understand the significance of that moment. Uh, Zechariah, he only served at the temple twice a year, two weeks out of the year, because there were thousands and thousands. I read up to like 20,000 priests that were all serving at this temple. And so when his name was chosen to go into near the Holy of Holies, into the inner courts, this was the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, his name wouldn't be chosen twice. There was, you know, it was, uh, the law was that only a priest could go once in their entire lifetime to enter into the presence of God this way. And so he went in, he took the opportunity, the one opportunity he had to enter into uh, the inner courts of the temple alone near the Holy of Holies and to offer up this incense. This incense would have been symbolic of the prayers of God's people. Uh, he would have prayed as any priest would have done. He would have prayed for the Savior. He would have prayed for a Messiah to come and to save God's people. And so it says in verse 10, and when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now this is where it gets pretty dramatic. It says in verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him like out of nowhere, in the middle of the inner courts, the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Uh, it says in verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. That's the news that Zechariah heard. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Now, the angel goes on. If you continue to read in, in the Bible, the angel goes on to give these many attributes of who would become John the Baptist, that he would be full of the Holy Spirit, even inside the womb, that he would bring joy, that he would bring delight. But if you skip down to verse 17, the latter half of verse 17, this is important. This is a major attribute of uh, this miracle baby's life is that he would make ready, verse 17, he would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, that was major news to Zechariah, who's praying for Messiah, because what he hears is that he's going to receive this miracle son who would prepare the way for God's people to receive this Savior and this Messiah to come. Like, there's a Savior coming. Imagine that moment for a second. Just, you know, kind of take a step back and put yourself in Zechariah's shoes. Here's a faithful man. Here's an old, elderly, faithful man who's a priest, uh, he has, he's obedient, he's righteous before the Lord, he's in good standing with the Lord, yet he's lost hope in you know, uh, him and his wife being able to conceive. Uh, for 400 years, the Lord hasn't spoken to his people. He's been there, he's always faithful, but he's been pretty silent. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the temple, as he's performing his duties, which is a once in a lifetime opportunity, there's this angel that appears. And he's like, I've heard you. God's heard your prayer. And he's about to move in a mighty way. You're going to receive this miracle child. And this miracle child is going to prepare the way for this other miracle child who would be the savior of the world. Now, that's good news, right? I mean, that's, that's that, I couldn't imagine being Zechariah in the moment. It's life changing, right? But here's, what, here's where I want to land. And this is where it's important for us. Uh, is in Zechariah's response. And so follow along with me in verse 18. This is how he responds to that good news. So Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? Another version of scripture would say, do you expect me to believe this? Right? Like, do you expect me to believe this? And then here was the reason. He even gave like a reasoning behind, how can I be sure of this? Because I'm an old man. 
And my wife is well along in years. And so this is really important that we understand what's going on here because here's this man of God. He's righteous before God. He's faithful. Uh, but at the same time, when he receives this news, this promise, this word from God, how does he respond? He responds with uncertainty and he responds with doubt. Now, listen, I think that there's different camps here. Because some of us may think, well, yeah, I would respond that way too, because it's just logical. Like, you know, it's reasonable for Zechariah to have this conversation with this angel and like, do you expect me to believe this? Because do you see how old we are? Is that even going to be safe? You know, like, how is this going to work? To come to God with doubt, it seems somewhat logical. Uh, some of us may be in the other camp. And maybe a majority of us are here where we say, man, if, if God hasn't spoken to his people for 400 years, all of a sudden, I'm in the holy of holies. I'm in the presence of God. This angel shows up. Whatever he says, I'm going to listen to. I'm going to obey. Like, this is, I'm excited about this, right? Like, Zechariah is crazy for doubting. Uh, he's crazy for his uncertainty in that moment. Either way, wherever you fall, uh, whatever camp you may be in, I think it's, it's worth having the conversation. I think this opens the door to something that we all deal with, that we all struggle with in some way, sometimes more subtle than others, and that's just simply doubting the word of God. Coming to him with like uncertainty. And here's what I mean. Like Zechariah... Sometimes, like what God says in his word, it just seems, and hear me out, maybe, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it just seems like unbelievable. Sometimes we fall into this temptation to put reason before faith and allow reason to overshadow or to supersede our faith. And without knowing it, we're having this conversation with God as we're reading his word or as he's giving us this promise. Like, you expect me to believe this? Like, do you, do, do you really expect me to believe that you're good, that you're merciful, that you care about me, even though it feels like my life is just falling apart? Do you, this is something that is a temptation. Do you expect me to believe that you're really truly a healer? I read that in your word and you promise that in your word, but we've been praying. I've been praying for uh, my father or my father-in-law or whatever for years and years. And it's like, he's not getting any better. Like you expect me to believe that you're a healer? You expect me to believe that you heal when I have friends who have kids that are dying of cancer? Like, what is that? You expect me to believe this? You, you expect me to believe that you have a purpose, that you have a plan for me? When, you know, all I've done is hurt people my whole life. Well, I don't deserve that. You expect me to believe that you are the great reconciler of relationships? Like you have the power to reconcile my marriage. You have the power to bring back these relationships that just have been broken for years and years. You expect me to believe this? I think we all fall into this temptation to doubt God from time to time. The good news is, the sliver of good news is, is that you're not alone. Uh, maybe some of you in here are like, yeah, that's me. Others of you may be more subtle. But we're not alone when we doubt the promises of God. All the way from the book of Genesis to the beginning of time. You know, uh, with all humanity, they've all, we've all doubted the promises of God. Let me give you, uh, you know, somewhat of a rundown. I did a little bit of research, and, uh, and let me see if I can find it here. So Old Testament, Moses, Gideon, Elijah, they all doubted their effectiveness in the kingdom of God, being used by God. Abraham doubted the promises of God. Isaac doubted the protection of God. This is all in scripture. You can read all this. Go into the New Testament with Jesus. The disciples, they doubted the commands of Jesus. Peter doubted the deliverance of God at one point. Martha doubted the authority of God. John the Baptist, this miracle baby that would come before Christ and prepare the way for Christ, he doubted the identity of Christ. It's something that, man, we all are tempted with. We all struggle with from time to time, whether you want to admit it or not. 
And the, the most important piece of this is that to doubt God is serious, serious business. And we see that with Zechariah. Check it out. In verse 19, as we continue, it says, the angel, after Zechariah responds with, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Like, how am I supposed to believe this? And here's my reasoning. Zechariah, uh, or the angel, said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you, Zechariah, this good news. In other words, I have the authority from heaven to bring this information, to bring this good news to you. It says in verse 20, and now, Zechariah, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because why? You did not believe my words. You came at me with doubt and uncertainty. You did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Verse 22, when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple uh, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Now, this is pretty weighty, and I want to kind of pause and understand a couple different truths that are going on. These are eternal truths that you and I can apply to our life, as we see from Zechariah here. And I'll tell you, if you're taking notes, there's, there's two different truths. One is super exciting. The other one, not so exciting. Uh, the first one. And I'm going to start with the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that uh, there is a consequence. There's always a consequence. There is a consequence to our doubt. There is a consequence. Take this in and understand this. There is a consequence to your doubt when you doubt God at his word, when you doubt his promises. And why I'm saying this is so important that we understand this, especially moving forward, 2019 into 2020, the culture that we're in. Because it just seems as though that like uh, there's this spirit that is tempting us to like kind of move forward in our doubt. It's almost appealing. It's almost, uh, it's like a sex appeal in some way. Like if we doubt God somehow, some way, when we choose to go in that direction of unbelief, we'll find like truth over here, right? But that's not what we see from Zechariah. Because when Zechariah doubted God in that moment, he became what? Silent. There was a consequence. And we can take silence as symbolic to our own circumstance in that when reason, hear me out, when reason overshadows our faith in God, what is that? That's sin. And I know this is a huge pill to swallow, but that is sinful. And sin, what does sin do? Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from the abundant life that he has for us. Sin separates us from the purposes and the plan and the destination that he has for us. Sin separates us from God. I imagine it's, uh, you know, I was thinking of an illustration, and the only one I could really come up with, or I did like kind of in a hurry, was I was thinking about... Um, uh, driving in San Francisco. Does anybody love, just love driving in the middle of San Francisco? Right? Um, I hate it. It's, I'm terrible at sarcasm, so I hate it. Just know I hate driving in San Francisco. I love the city, hate driving in the middle of it. But I will say, like, when Hannah and I, or when I'm with friends and we're going to the city, you know, there's a destination that we're obviously going to, and I'm all good as long as I'm driving and I'm watching my GPS or, you know, Siri tells me where to go. But the moment that I stop trusting Siri is the moment I start getting lost, you know? Have you been there before where you're like, ah, that doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to go this way, right? Like, no, the, the moment that I turn left when, you know, Siri tells me to turn right is the moment that I get stuck in more traffic, uh, the moment that I have no idea where I'm going. If, if I'm with Hannah, it just makes for a real dramatic occasion. Like, I just don't, it's just, it's terrible. Like, everything's just heightened. It's just, it, it keeps me away from where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to accomplish. In the same way, man, when we start doubting the direction and the word and the promises of God, we begin to separate ourselves from the purposes and the plan and the destination that he truly has created for us here on earth. There is a consequence to our doubt. 
But at the same time, does God give up on us? No. And this is the good news. This is what we see from Zechariah. And this is the second eternal truth that we have to be aware of, is that what God says he's going to do, God will do. Take it in. Make sure you're walking confidently with that, that what God says he'll do, what God says God does. It may not come in the form that you expect it to come. It may not come in the time that you expect it to come, but God will do what he says he's going to do. Write this down. Your doubt in him doesn't deter his love for you. Your doubt in him will never deter his love for you. That's what we see from Zechariah. If we continue, it says in verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. And this is where the miracle happened. The impossible happened. The promise came to fruition. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. If you skip down uh, to verse 57, and there's like a whole section of John the Baptist being born in that moment. And uh, you read, after he's born, uh, Zechariah is given the opportunity to name the child, and he writes on a tablet because he's still silent. He can't speak. He writes on a tablet, his son, or I'm sorry, his name is John. And it's like at that moment, uh, his, you know, immediately he was healed or he was freed of his tongue uh, being silent and he praised God and he spoke. It was like in that moment, uh, he surrendered to God and surrendered to the sovereignty, to the goodness and to the faithfulness of God knowing that he was truly the God of the impossible and the God of love. And it's the same for you and for me. This is a reminder for us that in the midst of the hardest moments in our life, whatever we may be going through, that God is sovereign, that God is good, that God is faithful. And because he's what? Motivated by what first? Love above everything else. Because his motivation is love, his word will always accomplish what it purposes to set out. Like his word never, ever, ever, the book of Isaiah says, returns void. It will never return void in your life. Now, does that mean, does that mean kind of moving forward that we can just walk in the freedom of doubt, knowing that what God says he's going to do, he's going to do? Well, no, of course not. Uh, Zechariah, and for you and for me, the call is uh, to be confident and to walk in the confidence of the word, to walk in the confidence of his promises. We've, we're singing about uh, you know, this spiritual battle that we go through every single day. Uh, the book of Ephesians talks about this spiritual battle. And for you and for me, it's to stand firm with this belt of truth, God's word, this belt of truth buckled around our waist, right? To walk in the word of God, That's the call. That's the command to walk in the salvation that we find through his word, to be confident in the work of his word made flesh, Jesus on the cross by the power of the resurrection, to be confident because, you know, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says all these promises that God makes in, in our life, this word, all these promises, you know how they come to fruition? You know, you know how we know that they never return void? They are yes every single time in Christ Jesus. Being confident in who Jesus uh, was on our behalf, the work of Christ on the cross. Being confident in the resurrection, knowing that it was through Jesus' resurrection that his promises and his word, they were resurrected as well. They become new life for us. If there should be a confident people in this world, it's us on this side of the cross, right? And so what God says he's going to do, what God says God does. Uh, I want to just somewhat wrap it up and answer a few questions that I know that, you know, as I was writing this sermon, uh, these were questions I had, and I imagine you have as well. Maybe some of you are like, okay, I hear you. I understand. Like, how do I move from this doubt that I'm feeling, from this unbelief 
in God and his word? Uh, how, how do I become more confident? Well, it starts, friends, listen, if you're taking notes, it starts with faith. It simply starts with faith. Uh, Jesus would say it starts with a mustard seed, like just a tiny little mustard seed of faith to move from doubt to a place where you're really standing firm on the word of God, just a mustard seed. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 that, look, um, faith, uh, uh, what is faith? Uh, faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Zechariah in that moment, he was a faithful, obedient, righteous man. But in that moment, man, he lost that faith because he did not believe that God could do what he says he was going to do. A mustard seed of faith starts with just believing that who God is, just believing that God is who he says he is and believing he's going to do what he says he does. Right? Simply just believing in him, believing that he uh, is who he says he is, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Maybe some of you are here today and you're thinking, okay, Mike, well, I have faith. Uh, maybe this is where a majority of us are. But I still doubt. Like now that you mention it, yeah, I do somewhat have unbelief here and there. How do I mature my faith? How do I grow my faith? Well, the book of Romans tells us, uh, uh, the book of Romans tells us that faith uh, comes by hearing, and hearing comes from what? The word of God. And so to grow in our faith, we simply jump in and we lean into the word of God. We get to know the character and the goodness of who Jesus is through his word. I was uh, thinking about this this morning, and I was like, okay, how do I get to like, in 2019, what does it look like for us to get to know someone? If I don't know them, maybe I know of them, maybe I see them around church or whatever. How do I really get to know somebody? Well, the first step I take is I go to their Facebook. And then I go to their Instagram and hope that it's like a public Instagram. And, and I just look, you know, I mean, listen, I'm not being a creeper. I'm just saying, I think we do this from time to time. We like go to their Facebook and we just look at their pictures. And we're like, okay, they have a family. They have kids. They respond in this way. They're really close with their family, whatever, right? Like this is how we get to, you know, slowly start to know people. Then eventually we say, uh, hey, how's it going? We have a conversation. We... Uh, you know, maybe exchange phone numbers. We start texting each other. Next thing you know, we're like at each other's house and we're just getting to know each other, right? Like this is how it works. In the same way, Jesus is saying, look, I, I've given you the opportunity to learn about my character and my goodness and my faithfulness. Just simply get in the word. Like start here, lean in. Draw close. Jesus says, look, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Simply come to me. Lean in, draw close, and you will begin to mature, to grow, and learn to trust me when it's hard. You know? Learn to trust me when it's hard. And so I want to just pause and challenge us with one question especially thinking about this Christmas season and all that the Lord has done for us. Where have you lost hope? Where have you lost hope? Where might you be from your heart in the most subtle way? Where, where, where might you be you know, hearing the word of God, hearing these promises, like Zechariah heard these promises, but having this subtle conversation with God of like, do you expect me to believe that? Where have you lost hope? Where has this reasoning and this logic kind of overshadowed or overtaken, you know, your faith? and who God is. My challenge to you, church, today, the challenge for all of us in this season is to stop, to pause, to turn back to Jesus and to trust the God uh, of the impossible, to trust the God that just loves you so much, that went to the cross on your behalf, that gave himself up, you know, from heaven to earth, 
humbly lived this perfect life, died this perfect death, giving us this incredible supernatural opportunity to experience, to participate in new life, both now and for all of eternity, to trust the God of the impossible, to trust the God of promise, to trust him at his word, that it never returns void, that he's able, that he's willing, and that he's ready to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask for, that you could ever imagine. Would you trust him today? It may not come in the form that you expect. It may not come in the timing you expect. We're going to talk more about patience in a couple of weeks, but will you trust him today, right now? Uh, let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you and praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this man, Zechariah, that, you know, he was a faithful man. He was a righteous man that, you know, he went into the temple. He encountered your word and that he came back with uncertainty. Thank you for teaching us, Lord, what that looks like, what the result of that somewhat looks like and see the symbolism in that when we come before you with uncertainty and with doubt, though it always happens, though we may be tempted in all these different ways, that it does separate us. So help us, dear God, help us to turn back to you, away from our reason, away from you know, the things of this world, away from the promises that this world has to offer. And let us turn back to you, God, and only to you and to your glory. Because we know, Lord, that your glory, that your word, that your promises will never, ever return void in our life. And we put that trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who gave everything for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said with me.